You're listening to Indications by the Conference Board. Welcome to the Conference Board's Indications podcast. Indications is a public podcast featuring our global roster of thought leaders. Topics range from economic growth and competitiveness to human capital, governance, sustainability, and beyond. Each episode is a serious conversation grounded in data and insights that will keep you ahead of the curve in a turbulent world. I'm here with a very special guest, Mr. Falan Yinouk, to discuss the semiconductor crisis fact fiction solutions. Falan is the director of economic strategy at Qualcomm. Prior to this, Falan was the director of industry statistics and economic policy at the Semiconductor Industry Association and has many years of experience in the U.S. government, holding posts at the U.S. International Trade Commission, Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, and the Office of Management and Budget. Falan also has a master's from the Harvard Kennedy School of Public Policy. Welcome, Falan. It's a pleasure to have you on our show. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Of course. Uh, So let's begin our discussion. Semiconductors are found in just about everything we use, but there seems to be not enough of them and also in the right places. Are we experiencing a semiconductor crisis or is the sentiment overblown? Yeah, well, Dana, I think um, it's really important to um, know that, you know, the semiconductor industry has notoriously been uh, a very cyclical industry and the market has swung uh, historically from periods of glut to periods of uh, shortages. So it's not really for folks who follow the semiconductor industry, uh, this current shortage is nothing new. I would say, however, though, the intensity of this shortage um, is certainly one for the books, uh, one for the ages, if you will. And there are a couple reasons for, I think, that happening. Um, I certainly think that the industry will eventually right the shortage and uh, increase supply to meet the the unprecedented demand that we've seen over the past two years. But certainly, I think, you know, we are uh, in a short-term crisis, but I think for the long-term, the industry will find a way to uh, to move this, to swing the uh, the cycle back to to meet the market demand, and then uh, and then as historically has happened, it may even swing uh, a little over. Well, that's good to know that this isn't forever. Um, we'll talk a little bit more later in terms of what's the timing, but all semiconductors are not created equal. What are the different types, and what are they used for? Yeah, no, there are definitely uh, distinct subsegments of semiconductors. The sort of the main difference uh, or the main two categories of semiconductors are what's called integrated devices and discrete products. Uh, most products that we use, end products, electronic products, or even other products uh, that, that contain a lot of semiconductors usually tend to have a combination of both ICs, integrated circuits, and discretes. Um, so usually our end products that we use today, whether it's a phone or a laptop, Uh, or even cars that are basically big computers on wheels these days, usually tend to have a lot of uh, variety of semiconductors that do different things. So even within the category of integrated circuits, for example, you've probably heard of, uh, you know, memory device, uh, in memory, um, you know, we have DRAM, we have NAND flash, basically like memory sticks um, that are portable these days. We also have analog uh, chips, uh, another big category, which help translate Uh, real world phenomenon into the digital world. So pressure or temperature um, or distance, right? You know, uh, a lot of these analog chips actually go into uh, cars because a lot of this information a driver needs while they're driving, they need to know how fast they're going or or what the temperature is or the pressure in their tire. Um, So analog is another big type of uh, subcategory. And of course, you have logic chips, uh, you know, microprocessors, the, the, the brains of, of, of all electronic products without microprocessors that process all this information that our computers are trying to, to process. Uh, it, you know, we wouldn't have as many advanced products as we do ha- do, do now. So, so those are the, the main big categories. But I would say the underlying uh, message is most end products have a variety of all of these products, all these subsegments within them. That's important to know because I was just going to ask you, which of those types of chips Mm. are are we seeing the greatest challenges? And it seems like it doesn't matter because most products are using one or more of these different types. That's 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 exactly right. You know, I think there are, well, a couple of things of just taking a step back over time more end products have more semiconductor content in them than say 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Uh, Our world is just becoming much more electronically based, right? And so a lot of end products that used to be 
uh, electrical are now electronic. Like you think of your coffee maker, right? You know, you have buttons that you press now to make your coffee make to set your coffee maker to you know you know start brewing automatically at five in the morning or whenever you wake up. Or your uh, you know your your um, laundry machine also you know has buttons on it. Um, so there's just more products in the world that have semiconductors in them because any sort of electronic product, the hardware behind that are chips. If you ever open up your laptop or open up a, a phone, you'll just see a whole bunch of uh, of basically small black boxes uh, with the name of a, a company on them. And those are the semiconductors, the hardware that's powering uh, a lot of these products. So a lot more chip content in uh, end products and a lot of, again, a variety of chips. So, you know, in order for end products to work, you have to have the whole suite of these products. And, you know, there can be a lot of products. You know, we um, did a a analysis of you know how many chips are in an average phone these days, right? And it's close to 200, about 169, I think, is what we came up with. How many chips are in an average car these days? It's well over a thousand, depending on the type of car, right? And so you need all of those chips, right? A lot of the problem um, with supply chains is for uh, semiconductors is that if you don't have that one chip uh, for your end product of the thousand that you need, whether it's your um, electric, you know, whether it's your automatic window that goes up and down, there's a chip that you know makes that happen, or whether it's your seat heating, you know, that you should press the button to you know, automatically heat your, you know, your, your seat, you know, whether you're missing, if you're missing those chips, like those two chips, and they could be chips that aren't like, again, the highly sophisticated types of microprocessors, you know, but, you know, chips that may cost a few cents. Um, but if you're missing those, then it's hard to sell that end product, right? You can't really sell a car if the salesperson's like, oh, well, the window doesn't really work, but, you know, we're working on that, you know? So, um, so yeah, you read, you really need the whole suite of chips. And again, because, there's just so much chip content in and products these, these days. And because um, of, of specialization within the industry, which I can talk a little bit more about, um, there are bottlenecks or choke points that have developed in, in the global supply chain for semiconductors that are certainly being um, coming to the fore now as we've uh, over the past couple of years as we've had this, uh, this shortage uh, occur. I'm glad you mentioned that because just thinking about the pandemic and now the war in Ukraine, these events have really highlighted the importance of semiconductors. How exactly have these events cre- increased demand and or reduced supply? Mm. No, that's a good question. You know, I think so as usually when analysts look at the semiconductor industry and the market and figure out, you know, how can we be sure that the industry is supplying the market uh, properly? Usually the Understanding demand has always been a pretty straightforward endeavor, right? You know, usually demand is steady and slow and up to the, slow and up and to the right, right? So, you know, this is very good. You know, you can sort of predict where demand is going, uh, and supplying the market has always been an issue um, in terms of just how the industry adds supply in terms of you know, creating new fabs. Um, but if you at least know where demand is going, then uh, you know, you can sort of kind of gauge and try to get supply right. What happened during the pandemic, um, which is a bit uh, unprecedented is that we actually had a total disruption in demand. So, uh, you know, we all, because chips are in so many things these days, so many products, when human behavior, especially at a global scale, changes like it did during the pandemic, that affects demand for chips. Because again, chips are in so many different things, right? So, you know, we all, I guess a little over two years ago, went remote. Uh, We all, uh, you know, started doing school from home. We all started doing uh, work from home. Well, that put uh, unprecedented and unanticipated uh, uh, demand on laptops and on other devices, on Zoom and other, you know, sort of ways of communicating uh, remotely. Well, all that requires more chips. You know, like I mentioned, laptops, there's tons of chips in laptops, you know, know, server farms to have, you know, added uh, capacity for doing remote whatever, remote work, remote school, that all added uh, unprecedented levels of demand for chips. Um, At the same time, other segments of uh, chip demand actually decreased. And again, based mainly on human behavior, right? You know, so we all started working from home. No one was driving. As I recall, I remember walking my neighborhood and I could just walk straight down the middle of the street, right? Uh, For, you know, weeks on end, you know, especially during the the height of the lockdown, because there were no cars uh, driving, right? And of course, that meant the auto manufacturers uh, who do need to purchase a lot of uh, semiconductors, because a lot of semiconductor content now are in cars, canceled their orders, right? So demand for the auto uh, and market uh, Went, sort of fell off a cliff. So these, this is how demand kind of went wacky, uh, and un, un, uh, in, in a way that it, we we had never really seen before. And so ultimately, 
there was actually more demand uh, overall and, and the market grew pretty strongly in 2020, as I recall, more than what was anticipated. And in 2021, it was very strong. It was um, uh, about 26, a little over 26% uh, year over year growth uh, for the global semiconductor market in 2021. Uh, and it reached uh, a level that it had never reached before. Um, it set a record, I think, at about 556 a billion dollars in sales according to the world semiconductor trade statistics program so the good news is yes there well first of all the challenge is that there's been short-term disruption in the industry in terms of the market uh and, and demand um i think i think that is the, the industry is working on solving that by adding capacity um but the bad news is that uh the way the industry operates uh capacity just can't be added very quickly. And I'm happy to sort of talk a little bit more about that on the, on the industry side, but um, but that's sort of where we are now. The industry is adding capacity, but in the short term, uh, there's no quick fix. There's no fix that you can, you know, you can, you can make that is like a week or a month long fix. It just takes a little more time to add that capacity. So you talked about the demand shock amid the pandemic, and we're kind of beyond the pandemic, at least in the U.S. A lot of economies are, are putting it in the rear view mirror, but now we're having this supply shock from the war. So for example, both Russia and Ukraine produce metals and substances like neon that go into semiconductor production. And so are they big enough players for that to inhibit the ramp up of production of semiconductors? Or is this something that we really shouldn't worry too much about? I don't know. Uh, well, the specific question about um, what is being produced uh, in Russia and Ukraine, I think, is something to be concerned about. But I think there is a bigger question, uh, which you sort of alluded to, which is the uh, supply, global supply, and and being sure that uh, certain components or inputs for semiconductor manufacturing or fabrication uh, are secure and are reliable, right? So the industry has even before it was fashionable, you know, was sort of the global po global poster child for taking advantage of global supply chains. The industry has been uh, globally oriented uh, since the 70s. Uh, you know, the industry was founded in the U.S. You know, Silicon Valley is called Silicon Valley precisely because the semiconductor industry was born there, and that created uh, the whole sort of ecosystem of Silicon Valley back in the in the 50s and 60s. But the industry quickly became uh, global in terms of where it did uh, various stages of, of the semiconductor fabrication process. So um, the industry, uh, the U.S. industry has had a presence in, for example, Southeast Asia for back end, what's called back end assembly test and packaging for uh, for decades. So, however, you know, you mentioned Russia and Ukraine and the war, you know, certainly there is now a much more how do we put it, a much more complicated geopolitical picture uh, than there was, uh, you know, certainly a year ago, and but, uh, you know, even certainly, you know, uh, you know, many, you know, several years ago uh, when things were, were operated more smoothly. So I think it's a question of where the industry can uh, adjust, what will need to adjust. I think the industry will probably still remain globally oriented in terms of how it manufactures, um, whether it's uh, doing the very various stages of, of fabrication. But I think it may just have to figure out where to adjust. And like I mentioned, there are these choke points that have developed, you know, where there are maybe, you know, a certain type of process or a certain um, input that is only now done by maybe a handful of, of companies in a handful of countries, right? Um, as the industry has evolved and become more mature and there's been consolidation. Uh, so that is something to to think about um, uh, in terms of being sure that the industry is able to supply the markets uh, smoothly going forward. As war rages in Ukraine, the Conference Board is closely monitoring the situation and producing timely and relevant content on a daily basis that will help the business community navigate this global geopolitical unrest. What will the impact be on oil prices, food prices, our supply chain? And what about cybersecurity? How will this conflict impact the way your organization does business around the world? And how will you communicate this crisis to customers and employees? We're gathering the very latest content on our website. Just head to conference-board.org and find trusted insights to help you and your team lead with confidence. Well, you spoke a lot about um, supply chains within four semiconductors. Um, when I look at the semiconductor supply chain as someone who's, you know, kind of a novice, it seems like there is concentration among only a few economies at these at 
just about every single point. So for example, the intellectual property, a lot of that's in the US, as you mentioned. Remember there was this James Bond movie <laughs> that was all mm-hmm. about um, you know, this one company creating all these semiconductors so that they could flood the market or something like that. But it was based in California. Um, when you look at the raw materials, a lot of it's in China or, or the US or Eastern Europe. And then a ton of the production is really dominated by a few companies in in Taiwan and South Korea. So what are the risks associated with the lack of diversification at these various nodes on the supply chain? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think risk is certainly uh, the the right way of categorizing it. There are, as I mentioned, a number of, uh, of choke points, if you will, in the industry in terms of high concentration of a number of a small number of firms or uh, a country doing uh, the vast majority of a, of a certain activity. Um, uh, just a couple examples. You mentioned Taiwan, for example, the world's largest uh, pure play foundry, um, which is a company which basically just designs, uh, which which manufactures chips on behalf of others. For example, Qualcomm. Qualcomm is a company that just designs chips and they need to work with the foundries to do the manufacturing do their manufacturing, which are sort of like the architects and they're sort of like the builders, if you will. Um, uh, most of that uh, is dominant. Most of the pure play foundry uh, uh, segment of the, of the industry is dominated by uh, a company called TSMC, uh, which is a Taiwan semiconductor manufacturing company, which is headquartered in Taiwan and has most of their manufacturing there. Um, well, that's a very small geographical location to have the, the vast majority of the world's foundry uh, capacity located. Also to a regional concentration, uh, 75% of all global fab fabrication manufacturing, uh, chip manufacturing is now done somewhere in, in Asia, in the Asia region, right? So um, there is a high, high concentration both of activity, both at the, re- at the country level and all the regional level um, in, in Asia. Also to, for example, even uh, uh, the tools uh, that are manufactured, uh, that are used in the manufacturing process, there are uh, there's a high concentration of companies uh, or, or the the tool who makes the tools is a high, is highly concentrated. For example, uh, there's one tool um, called a photolithography, which is a tool that basically any fab uh, that is making whatever type of uh, chip needs to have. It's a sort of horizontal process that that is vital for making any chip. Um, well, basically, there's really just one company now that that dominates that 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 uh, making of that tool. It's a Dutch company called ASML, which is um, headquartered, headquartered in the Netherlands. There are a couple other players who are Japanese, but but really, so so if you think about it, like, oh my gosh, if something were to happen in Taiwan or something were to happen in you know the Netherlands, you know, then we you know that 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 could really really uh, cause trouble for the industry in terms of being able to produce. Um, and uh, by extension, now that because chips are in so many end products and, and sort of you know, in some ways, helping to run the world, um, um, it, it could spell, uh, you know, a lot of disruption even for the global economy. So uh, something to, to really, um, uh, which I think over the last couple of years, both the uh, pandemic and the uh, now geopolitical tensions and the, and, and the rise of, of, of those issues have really brought to the forefront in terms of the importance of semiconductors and how to maintain properly functioning uh, global supply chains. Well, given these choke points uh, along the supply chain, which economies have the capacity to ramp up production of the raw materials, the intermediate components, and even the finished supplies of of chips? Well, you know, it's really interesting. There has been a lot of regional concentration. I think you alluded to this with, you know, uh, the U.S., for example, companies like Qualcomm specializing in the highly R&D intensive type of activity, such as designing a chip. Whereas there's a lot of uh, concentration of the actual manufacturing at the front end, front end fabrication, and also back end assembly, test and packaging taking taking place in in Asia. The question is, you know, how to diversify and create other um, uh, areas where there's you know sort of a backup or resilience to this. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. I think this is where um, public policy can play a role uh, to help incentivize creating uh, sort of uh, other uh, sources of capacity. Uh, to help with any future, you know, disruptive events, whether it's um, environmental or geopolitical, uh, or like another pandemic, right? Um, uh, and that's where you know governments have been taking action. We see the U.S. government, um, you know, Congress is, you know, in some various stages, uh, working through the process of of passing what's called the the Chips Act, 
um, which would help incentivize uh, domestic manufacturing uh, and R&D activities here in the U.S. Uh, the European Commission is also uh, in the process of, of working through a 40, I think it's a $48 billion uh, pr uh, proposal to also do the same thing. So, you know, I think governments are trying to figure out ways to create resiliency and redundancy within the global supply chain so that the next time there is a, a a disruption, um, sort of a black swan event, like we've seen over the past couple of years, um, that the, that the that the industry, the global industry, will be able to you know operate uh, and continue to to function and, and and supply the supply the market. So, what are the practical, political, and environmental challenges to increasing production? So, for example, how long does it take to build a production facility? Mining of raw materials can be environmentally unfriendly and thereby restricted by governments. Or companies may not wish to import materials from specific economies for fear of reprisal, for example, secondary sanctions and, and the like. So what are your thoughts on this? Well, certainly you're right. You know, it's going to take time. You, you mentioned building a fab, right, a front-end fabrication facility. This is one of the most most advanced and complicated types of uh, activities, building a chip, right? It's um, someone once described it to me many years ago uh, as modern-day alchemy. It's sort of like magic, right? How do you turn something like sand or silicon into something that you know, powers communication over thousands of miles with your cell phone or, you know, uh, something, uh, you, know, comp you know, computers that are able to do, you know, billions of computations in a, in a split second, right? So it's not easy to do and, um, and both building a fab and then continuing to innovate uh, the uh, semiconductors um, is, is both costly and time consuming. So, you know, building a fab can take uh, up to, you know, two years to do. So, you know, the, the, the industry necessarily, is it, it's very hard for the industry to respond very quickly to changes in demand, right? Like, as I've said to, uh, in, to other audiences, you know, there's no such thing as a pop-up fab, right? So, uh, you know, demand spikes like we've seen over the past, you know, with the pandemic and, you know, people say, why can't the industry produce more chips? Well, it's because it takes basically two years to build a fab. You know, again, we're not just building, you know, um, we're not just building like, you know, small structures here, you know, they're very big, they cost, you know, 20 to, to forty billion dollars, uh, usually to to build and equip and operate, um, so um, very big costs to to build these, and so there has to be a lot of thought that goes into doing it, and it just takes time to make. And again, trying to figure out where uh, to diversify, that's where I think governments can uh, help to incentivize building facilities in other other areas that may be um, where there's less concentration already. Well, you've mentioned the role of government, and indeed semiconductors have become the focus of industrial policies around the world. Which governments are targeting chip technology for purposes of facilitating the goals of industrial policies and why? So, for example, in the U.S., there was an executive order around industrial policies, around supply chains, and indeed some of the reasons were national security or preventing economic disruption or tariffs and sanctions. So which economies are really serious about this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, I would say... At least for the U.S. government, it's industrial policy uh, su surrounding semiconductors and um, promoting the, the U.S. semiconductor industry or semiconductor activity in the U.S. It's not new. Uh, it's been done before, certainly in the 80s, but it's it's relatively new in terms of the, the government getting back into trying to do this. I will say, though, you know, other countries' governments have long had policies to help incentivize uh, the growth of their domestic semiconductor industry, either by creating incentives for foreign companies uh, to establish uh, their uh, established facilities in, in their countries uh, or to grow their domestic industry. You know, the Chinese have, uh, government has done this uh, certainly increasingly so since 2014 with a new set of policies they put in place to grow their domestic indigenous semiconductor industry. Um, but a lot of other countries have also had um, incentive policies to help uh, grow their uh, the semiconductor industry in their country. Um, what, what is definitely new, I think, is what the U.S. government is doing. I know the European government has also proposed a incentive package. Even the Indian government, um, which has long wanted to grow its semiconductor industry, is now proposing, I believe, a $10 billion dollar a proposal to help incentivize uh, semiconductor ma manufacturing or semiconductor activity in their country. I think in terms of looking at the market, I think it's important to understand that I think the market is 
is the good news is the market I think is is going to be growing, and this is good when you're trying to incentivize all this new capacity. You fear, of course, you know, oversupplying the market with all these end products uh, and the chip content in so many end products growing. You know, I think um, we're looking at probably growing from, as I mentioned, uh, from a a $500 billion market in 2021 to doubling that to being a trillion dollar market in only uh, eight to 10 years. People are talking about, you know, having a trillion dollar market in 2030. The market took basically 50 years to get to a $50 billion market. So that indicates, you know, in, you know, strong demand, you know, a lot of end markets uh, that are growing, uh, long-term growth drivers in the industry. So with all this, these these efforts to to incentivize uh, more capacity by governments uh, through government policy, you know, I think um, there is a market uh, that will be there. Um, it's just a question of whether the short term, you know, there will be some disruptions again as that market as, you know operates in a very cyclical manner. Uh, whether that will be um, how smoothly that will go over the next few years. I also will say that you know there is a lot of concentration in the type of activities and the types of chips that are being made by different companies now. There's a lot of specialization, uh, so that you know a memory company, for example, that just does memory, they don't do anything else. They just do memory, right? Or you know a, a company that focuses on analog chips. Um, you know because of competition, most companies now just focus on maybe producing one type of uh, subsegment of, of semiconductors. Um, so understand, and understanding and being sure that um, whatever incentives are in place are not oversupplying a certain area uh, while, you know, while not creating incentives for others, I think will, will be um, important to try to, to get right. You know? Timing is everything. And certainly chip shortages are contributing to high, higher inflation around the world presently. However, as you mentioned, we increase digital transformation and absorption of the latest technologies that use chips. So, for example, AI and the metaverse, demand will continue to increase. Is there any end in sight to chip shortages and the rising cost to produce goods and services dependent upon them? I said I would come back to this at the beginning of the conversation. So when can the cyclical nature and the re and the fabs that are being created now, when does that all coalesce into more computer chips and less of a shortage that we're seeing now? So most folks now, when you've talked to uh, industry analysts, uh, think that the second half of 2022 is when we'll see uh, an alleviation of the shortage. But again, you know, there there may be pockets of uh, shortages still. Uh, you know, again, not all fabs are making all types of chips, right? So if you have an end product that requires a whole bunch of various types of chips, if there's still a shortage in the production of, say, analog chips, and you, you know, you need, you know, a certain number of analog chips for your end product, then there could be some pockets of, well, we need to get that analog, you know, the, the, the global, you know, the industry hasn't quite in, quite gotten up to, uh, you know, increased capacity for the analog, uh, you know, subsegments. So we're still going to have some, some sort of pockets of low capacity uh, here and there. But, you know, it's um, usually when I've looked at the industry and how the, the, the cycle operates, usually, it, you know, once, uh, you know, things move, can, can move very quickly overnight. Once capacity is built, uh, fabs run, you know, 24 seven, you know, there's, you know, it's a major investment that semiconductor companies make when they, you know, decide to build a 20 plus billion dollar fab. So they need to uh, run them all the time, basically. Right. And so, you know, they'll be putting out chips um, and hopefully there, there won't be too many fabs doing all that at one time, because then you will get, again, the, the cycle of having an oversupplied market. Um, but, you know, there's just, a, you know, again, to recoup that cost of like a 20 plus billion dollar investment, there's a uh, you know, a, a strong incentive for companies to, once they build the fab, start just making chips uh, and trying to supply the market as quickly as possible. Um, so I would suspect once once there is, uh, you know, more fabs and built uh, and running and uh, ramped up, we will see, we'll see, you know, uh, the, the cycle turn and we'll see more, you know, capacity added and hopefully it'll be added and not overly, over, overly supplied because I think, you know, you want to get it right. Uh, you want to, you want to, you don't want to get demand and, and supply at the right level uh, and not over, oversupply because then, then you start eroding price, you know, prices start to erode and you'd have this glut situation, which can be really uh, also a challenge for the industry. 
Well, in the interim, what are businesses doing to overcome the current chip shortages? For example, are they creating vertical business models? Are they so- sourcing local producers? Are they fi- financing production of new facilities themselves? And also, how can governments help? You mentioned earlier that governments have a role to play in facilitating chip production. So kind of a two-part question there. Yeah. So I would say, you know, I think one thing we've discovered uh, or sort of uh, understood in uh, over the past couple of years is uh, the need for uh, perhaps customers to hold more inventory. Um, you know, that's, you know, the whole uh, just-in-time um a model of of only only getting what you need and not holding an inventory it kind of works until you kind of get a situation we've had over the past couple of years and and you just you need a lot more supply and it's not there right that you don't that you don't have so I think I think a lot of customers are 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 thinking about uh, changing their business practices especially now that uh, you know chips have become just again so important for uh, end products and having the whole suite of chips um, you know it's really interesting one company um, that has been highlighted in the media as actually weathering uh, the chip shortage pretty well uh, was Toyota. Um, And um, that is because I think they had a lot more inventory than a lot of other downstream customers, especially in the auto auto sector. Uh, They actually learned and decided to change practices after the, um, I think it was 2011 tsunami in Japan, uh, which basically took a whole bunch of uh, uh, of 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 capacity offline and and they had and there was a similar type of chip shortage there um, and so they decided okay we we want to have at least you know six months or how many months worth of of inventory that we have um, in case there is another event like this and lo and behold you know that's certainly what has happened over the past couple of years with the with the pandemic so I think holding more inventory is something that you know companies are are thinking about understanding the the the, the nature of the of the global semiconductor supply chain is something that I think customers are also thinking more about um, you know the semiconductor industry is um, you know there are a lot of different pieces and it's globally oriented and you know there are companies that work on behalf of other you know as a subcontractor in some ways to uh end cus- end sellers of chips for example i mentioned you know foundries for example right you know they don't sell end chips but they make chips on behalf of companies like like qualcomm who then sell, sell the end chip that they've designed um so understanding like who makes and, and where down the supply chain as if you're an end customer does all this and where where they do it and what could potentially be a problem uh, in terms of our our supply chain long way upstream or downstream if you will uh, is something i think companies are are thinking more about um, in terms of trying to ensure that uh, supply going forward Um, you mentioned also a question uh, the second part of that question related to governments or or policies to help production yes yeah i think um, in the short term you know i think there unfortunately i don't think there's really uh, much uh, policymakers can do in the short term. It's really um, something that the industry has to to work on to increase capacity through either building fabs or increasing what's called fab capacity utilization, basically running fabs that is as, as you know as, as high output as possible. And that's what the industry has been doing. However, going back to what I mentioned, I think earlier in our conversation, uh, it's just again, there's no such thing as a pop-up fab. It just takes time and you know, there's no magic bullet that either the industry can, you know, use or policymakers can use to say, hey, you know, like, you know, put out more production tomorrow. Um, you know, if fabs are running at, you know, 95 plus fab capacity utilization, that means they're just running and nonstop and they're not even stopping for uh, maintenance of, of equipment and tools, which is probably not the best thing to do long term, which is why companies don't do that. Um, but when there's extreme uh, demand, that's what they've been doing. And then, of course, the added, you know, uh, adding more fab capacity um, is sort of the longer term solution, um, which the industry has been ongoing and doing. Uh, fab cap, you know, what's called CapEx or cap, uh, um, capital equipment purchases have been historic over the past uh, couple of years, um, over $100 billion, probably, I think, approaching $150 billion for 2020. 2022. Um, so ex- extraordinary levels of uh, fab capacity, um, um, fab equipment uh, purchasing and trying to add capacity, but it just takes time. I think in the longer term, um, and what the uh, what policymakers around the world are are doing with such uh, such as the CHIPS Act and um, the other uh, similar types of uh, efforts to incentivize um, added uh, fab capacity um, is helpful in terms of diversifying and creating resilience for the next time that there is 
um, um, a disruption in the global uh, uh, global semiconductor supply chain. One thing too, also too, I think it's important to add in terms of how governments or policymakers um, may want to think about um, how to incentivize uh, the industry and you know creating added uh, uh, resilience. There's a question of creating um, uh, added resilience in the global supply chain, which helps the global supply chain uh, for semiconductors uh, work effectively. Um, there's also the question of what, uh, where you as a country, and this is where you know countries, uh, policymakers, and, and governments uh, want to think about where they want to be in the global supply chain, right? You know, do they want to be focusing on manufacturing? Do they want to focus on uh, R and D intensive, uh, you know, activities such as you know the designing of semiconductors? It's really impossible, I think, the, this day and age for any one country to do it all. You know, the industry is, is globally oriented, um, has been. Um, it's what a actually allows the industry to produce at the lowest uh, uh, costs to enable, you know, uh, you know, great products uh, that are powered by chips to go into consumers all over the world um, and, and be affordable. So really focusing on what part of the, of the what I would call not the global supply chain, but the global value chain for semiconductors you want to focus on uh, and want to incentivize, I think is an important question that um, policymakers should think about. So finally, what are your recommendations to firms that are either struggling amid uh, the current shortages uh, before things loosen up, or even companies that are looking for opportunities to help support uh, the production of semiconductors? So I guess two, two ends of the candle there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. One is a one one the downstream customer and one the industry itself, I suppose, uh, is another way of looking at it. Yeah. Well, you know, I I, I think if there's um, you know, it's really interesting. You know, I've been uh, you know working and following and analyzing the industry for you know a number of years now, and I think um, if there's any silver lining that um, that I can see through uh, over the past year plus of sort of the struggles that the industry has um, has undergone, it's the fact that more people now know about the industry and even more customers understand the importance of the industry to their business which i don't think was the case honestly you know uh, you know uh, before two years ago um, i think semiconductors have has always have always been this product that's sort of behind the curtain right it's like the stuff inside your computer that seems to be magically making it work right and now you know it's taken sort of a crisis uh, to sort of show um, and uh, have uh, downstream customers whether are consumers like you and i or the intermediate, um, you know, downstream business that you know consumes semiconductors for their own end products to really appreciate uh, semiconductors uh, and the need for ensuring uh, supply chains for their businesses. So, you know, I think again, there are a lot of different practices uh, that I think businesses, uh, customers can think about um, doing. Which again, you know, holding more, holding more uh, inventory, understanding. Uh, the business a little bit more uh, for their for their own um, uh, for their own uh, needs, and then also I think uh, you know just um, in, in terms of the uh, the semiconductor uh, uh, the the supplier side, you know continuing uh, to increase capacity I think is is going to be important because of the long term growth drivers. Again, the short term the industry has been doing everything that it can do. What I would say, um, alluding back to the question of you know where in the value chain we want to operate uh, in and and how to create a continued healthy industry, you know I think taking advantage of this opportunity now to, that where the world is sort of focusing on semiconductors to try to get more uh, people interested, uh, workers interested in in becoming in in entering the workforce, uh, the semiconductor workforce, I think is going to be key. Workforce issues. It's all about the people at the end of the day, and having high skilled engineers, uh, you know, that workforce I think is a really uh, key uh, component uh, for the the health of the semiconductor industry going forward long term. So, um, you know, STEM programs that's a long term issue uh, to try to increase uh, uh, the importance and interest among young people in math and science and engineering. Uh, and then uh, longer term, you know, uh, and in shorter term, thinking about um, you know uh, certainly in the U.S. Uh, high-skilled immigration policies that will allow more, uh, you know, a broader market of, of uh, skilled workers uh, to help um, with these, you know, sort of technological and, and innovation challenges that we're all facing in terms of continuing to create, you know, greater and more sophisticated types of chips to help again power the, uh, you know, uh, the, the, all the products we love and and and, and just our, our our economy, you know. <laughs> so that's what I would say uh, in terms of both on the consumer side and, and on the supplier side. 
Thank you, Falan. This this has been such a great conversation. And thank you again for joining us. Oh, you're very welcome. It's been my pleasure, Dana. So this has been Indications from the Conference Board. If you enjoyed this podcast, you may listen to additional The Conference Board offerings by going to our website or find us wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks again for joining us and for listening. This has been Indications from the Conference Board.